What's up, everybody? Welcome to the fifth episode of The Neutral, you know, your weekly podcast about fighting games. And, you know, this week is not about end sh- Endemic Shine. You know, we, we keep forgetting to delete this uh, to delete this topic. But uh, this week, we have a really cool guest, you know, a little bit different than what we've been doing. You know, we've done commentators and we've done pro players. This week, we have sort of an ex-pseudo-competitor. Uh, you may have read some of his dope articles, you know, like why you learn more from losing and why playing weaker people, uh, can make you a better player. We have Patrick Miller. So let's get him on the screen. There we go. What's up? Nice so, to see you. Excuse me, ex-competitor. I still go to my local. <laughs> I'm still going at Combo Breaker. I'm still going at Eva. I'm leaving bodies behind, okay? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. You know, but I, I appreciate I, I, the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> That's valid. That's super valid, you know. Uh, I always start my shows with a little bit of shade, so I, I can't <laughs> help it. It's not, it's not on purpose, or is I, it? I appreciate shade throwing being part of your show's brand going on, right? Like, I, I just... At the end of your first season, I need to see like a montage of just all the times that you have just the people who you're interviewing. Right? I feel like, you know, sometimes people think that being on a show means that they're just gonna get their butt kicked the whole time. And mm-hmm. we're not we're not always about that. <laughs> so usually I ask people about their handle, but instead what I, I really wanna just like start with like the chronological history for you. So like what was mm-hmm. your first fighting game so it doesn't have to be like the one you competed at but like what's the first fighting game that like you like picked up the controller and played or went to the arcade yeah yeah so my first fighting game was street fighter 2 um i was six when it came (laughs) out and i just like i I i've loved video games since i was a kid like some of my first memories were playing super mario brothers one on my friends nes's uh, in grade school, like I was always the kid that you'd invite to the sleepover, not because you liked him, but because you <laughs> rented the game and you needed somebody who had never played it before to beat all the shit that you couldn't beat, right? And I first saw Street Fighter II at a 7-Eleven. I actually just went back there. That's, that 7-Eleven's been closed, but it was on Clement Street. So shout outs to the proto FGC in San Francisco. And uh, I saw it there and like my dad gave me like a dollar a week for allowance and I just, I just burned whatever I could. Like I could barely <laughs> the cabinet but i'd be mashing buttons uh and i remember getting the snes version and just thinking like this divides my life into two eras you have the before i had a video a fighting game at home era and a post getting street fighter 2 on snes um but i didn't actually play that seriously like i was super into street fighter 2 in the way that kids can be super interested in something but not really very good at it right so street fighter 2 mortal Kombat, like you kind of rode that train because that was the hype shit for several mm-hmm. years just like oh a new fighting game it comes out you see an arcade at a friend's birthday or whatever you play it um the first game that i got super into was cvs2 and there's kind of like a backwards build up to that where uh i was this was in high school and i was messing around with uh, just random SNES ROMs, right? And I find this ROM called Gundam Wing Endless Duel. Oh, I know man. Not, I don't know any of this. I, I don't know shit about anime at this point either. But I'm like, oh, this looks cool. And I see fucking Death Scythe and Heavy Arms and all this cool shit. And I'm like, all right, this looks tight. And it actually got me into anime and it got me into fighting games. So I like to say that that game ruined my fucking life. <laughs> what? What? There is nothing wrong <laughs> being a part of the Weeb Nation, all right? There is there is nothing wrong, okay? Fighting games, when, you can acceptably say probably ruined your life, but anime probably <laughs> made your life better. The, when when uh, when I wrote the the, uh, the 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 primer on Street Fighter Two and on fighting games, my dad and I showed it to my dad. He asked me if he thought if if I thought that I would have been a lawyer if he had never got me any video games. I was like, yeah, probably. And then he just he didn't say anything for like a minute or two. He just walked away, head held down, like this. I I now know where he went yeah. wrong, and it was all <laughs> my fault. <laughs> so it was Gundam Wing got, and then after that I got into Alpha 3 which got me into CVS 1 and that's where I met someone at my high school who was like oh you like fighting games I like fighting games and so he brought he would bring his Dreamcast and, and his controllers and shit to school and would play CVS 1 and he'd show me where some of the arcades were um, and then CVS 2 came out and that was kind of where shit got, got, got hype and especially in NorCal like CVS 2 was our game uh, that got a whole lot of energy from all over the place 
Uh, so I would I would spend like, like after school every day I'd take a bus over to UC Berkeley and play at the barricade and that was kind of the the thing that I I, I first really kind of went deep on. All right, yeah, I've heard a lot about uh, that arcade at the at UC Berkeley because there used to be a podcast that I would listen to called the S Words Podcast, and um, <laughs> what I know is I can't why can't I remember his name? Uh, Dominic uh, Gwyn. Uh, yeah. He, he he would talk about that a lot, about that era of, like, going there and, like, playing fighting games with people and whatnot. So Yeah, I remember him coming through for Soul Calibur 2, I think, and a little bit of Guilty Gear. Uh, he's actually still around in the uh, in the, the local FGC. I see him show up to, like, a game center uh, at, for NorCal dogfights and stuff. But, yeah, there's, there's a lot of folks. Actually, fun fact, Ultra David, mm -hmm. uh, his... Fighting game roots were also at UC Berkeley. He went to UC Berkeley for undergrad. He used to hang out at the Third Strike Cab, and uh, like back then, he like wasn't particularly social with most of the folks who were who were who were playing there on the regular. Um, and so it was super crazy to see him show up as like a fighting game personality and as a commentator because all of us were just like, "Yo, that's the dude who just randomly plays Third Strike, right?" <laughs> like that's all we knew him as. Oh, man. But there's a lot of there's been a lot of greatness to come from the Berkeley Barricade. I'm I'm proud to be one of them, even though I was actually never a Berkeley student. Uh, I still got to compete in the UC Berkeley like team tournaments and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. All right, so like you know you 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 opened this great avenue already. Uh, where you know saying the word compete, which is I mean it's 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 obvious that you're like super passionate about fighting games. But I want to sidebar a bit because uh, it comes up a lot during your streams and it comes up in a lot of your like coaching and trainings and teachings, which is that you're also really into jujitsu. Yeah. So like, how did you, because it seems like you, you were super passionate about fighting games, you know, going to the arcades a lot and all of that. And obviously to like be good at a martial art, you're also going to have to go and train and do that a lot. So like, how did you get into jujitsu? And then like the the way that you tell the story could also involve like, how did you balance the, like your two big passions? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually got into IRL fighting games through <laughs> video fighting games. After playing CVS two and some Guilty Gear for a couple of years, when I went off to college, um, I, I saw that there was a PE class for Shotokan Karate. And I was like, yo, that's that shit that Ryu and Ken do. <laughs> so, so I was like, all right, well I've like, I, I kind of think, so I grew up, like, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is my shit. Like, I grew up during the, the Karate Kid, Three Ninjas, like, Power Rangers, mm -hmm. all that stuff, Same. right? Like, uh, yeah, and so, like, this, like, late fascination with martial arts has kind of always been there. Like, it's always something that I wanted to do, but I never knew how to get involved. So I started going to the Shotokan Karate class as, like, a PE class. I was like, yo, this is pretty fun. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of like a fighting game. And then one day, one of the black belts came in, and, and he's kind of like massaging his neck. He's like, man, I just got my ass whooped at the Brazilian jiu-jitsu class. And I was like, so I play CBS 2 I'm about picking a top tier. Like, I have K-groups to got on my team. <laughs> if you got your ass from this other class, then I want to go do that, right? Uh, and so I signed up for Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and just from there I got into both, uh, like, kickboxing, MMA, wrestling, like, all that stuff, right? All the combat sports goodness. Um and like fighting games, I just I have a really hard time putting things down. Like if I if I love doing something, I will find a way to keep doing it. Um, and so what I found was like one, video games are great for for building all kinds of mental muscles, but not so much the physical muscles, right? And I needed to, I wanted to get in shape, right? Like Patrick Miller of like two thousand three was like six four, like same height, but like maybe a buck seventy if he's lucky. Mm -hmm. Right. So like there was a lot of room to grow there. Um, and the other thing was uh, when I was in school, so I was I was out. Uh, I went out. Uh, I went to school in the Claremonts, which is kind of like it's SoCal, but it's like way the fuck out there. Mm -hmm. um, I was near James Games and I was near Arcade, Arcade Infinity, but I didn't have a car. So I couldn't get out to places regularly, which meant that the IRL fighting games kind of uh got me, they, they, since they were so much easier to access, I ended up spending most of that time focusing on my IRL fighting games, working on my jiu-jitsu, my kickboxing, my wrestling, all that stuff. Um, and this was pretty early on in like the kind of the, the MMA boom, right? Like I had been training for about a year or two when the Ultimate Fighter happened. And the Ultimate Fighter was like one of the big moments in UFC history to really bring in a lot of people into MMA, right? Um, so I, I would just keep training and it, it the 
the the growth path there kind of mirrored fighting games where I was like, if I want to get better, not only do I need to put a lot of work in, I also need to train a lot of different people. So I take every opportunity I could to go to different gyms and, and just study under different people and just learn um, from as many different people as I could to kind of get a better sense of, of what these arts were like and how I could get better at them. Um, but probably the turning point for me, so if most of my college time was actually spent training IRL fighting games and not playing a whole lot of Street Fighter or Guilty or whatever, um, the turning point for me was uh, I actually got a research fellowship, uh, a Fulbright fellowship to study in Japan for a year after I finished undergrad. And it was super cool because you get the, in, in the application, you have to pitch your own, your own project. And my project was actually about studying Brazilian jiu-jitsu in Japan. Um, there's this really cool history where basically Brazilian jiu-jitsu was formed um, from the kind of immigrant history of Japanese people going to Brazil in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. That was kind of how judo came to Brazil. Um, and then there was like a, a reverse migration trend that happened in the 1980s where a lot of Brazilians, like ethnic kind of maybe third generation Japanese Brazilians came back to Japan uh, to, to work in like factories and stuff. And so I wanted to study how Brazilian jiu-jitsu was used as kind of uh, like a community forming sport um, between these two communities, right? Between like the, the kind of ethnic Japanese and the Japanese Brazilians and learn more about uh, the practice of Brazil, Brazilian jiu-jitsu in different contexts, um, which was basically a really fancy way of saying uh, I got the government to pay me to train Brazilian jiu-jitsu for a year in Japan. <laughs> and, and I got to train with like pro fighters, but I also got to train with like dudes who just worked at like a you know refrigerator assembly plant, right? Like pretty much the gamut of folks, you know, just like everyday hobbyists, as well as like some folks who I've seen later fight in the UFC, which is pretty cool. Um, so, so yeah, like I kind of just kept engaging when I, when I came back to the U S I actually worked for a year as a, as a, a youth boxing coach in East Oakland, um, for this nonprofit gym, uh, Shaza East Oakland boxing association. What they do is they, they have, they're basically run a free boxing gym so that, uh, like kids in East Oakland who would otherwise be getting into some like gang shit can instead just work out and also like kind of, uh, use their energy on something useful around a bunch of people who are kind of committed to keeping a positive environment. And so that's kind of like, I've continued to train since then, but it's all, for me, it's always been about finding balance. One of the things that I learned pretty early on is when I'm doing fighting games, if that's the main shit that's on my head all the time, and then I do poorly at a tournament, I feel really, really bad. Right. I'm like, man, I kind of had all my emotional eggs in one basket. Right. Like if if the time and effort that I spend on something represents how much I care about it um, and then I feel like my efforts aren't paying off. Well, that's a huge demotivator. So rather than go all in on one fighting game or all in on one activity, what I try to do, do is balance myself. Right. Try to stay consistent uh, in both fighting games and in IRL fighting games. Right. But uh, I try not to. Um, focus too heavily on one or the other because I know that I am emotionally more uh, I'm more stable and I'm, I, it's easier for me to stay consistent over the long haul if I'm doing multiple things at once right and the great thing is that they actually do benefit each other like I can take things that I'm thinking about in boxing or in jiu-jitsu and I can apply them to fighting game stuff and vice versa there's a lot of concepts around like space control and uh, and like hard reads and yomi right? The fucking RPS stuff. A lot of that applies in fight in real fights, right? And in martial arts, but usually you don't start learning to that stuff until a lot later because you have to learn all the physical stuff first. Right. Um, so yeah, like for me, it's just about all about always keeping my brain going and feeding it a whole bunch of different things. And sometimes that'll be like a punch or a kick. And sometimes that'll be like doing some fucking shit on my stick. My, my stick's off camera right now, but you can kind of hear it. <laughs> You know, I think that's like a, a, re a really interesting thing because like, you, you say it a lot during your stream. You, you bring it up a lot during a lot of your video content of like, you know, fighting games is sort of this uh, the way you like work out your brain like that. It's like push ups and, and stuff for your brain. And so I think it's like this really interesting concept that you you sort of try to perpetuate very much that like there is a lot of real life value to being good at fighting games or even just playing fighting games i should say because you know yeah. good is a relative term uh so i i know that you you, you like work in the game industry and i know <laughs> that you got the government to pay for you to go to japan to learn to like learn jujitsu so like my but i i'm not hearing a degree or a form of study like <laughs> <laughs> like how what what did you go to 
school for slash like how did you get into the game Turn. industry yeah yeah it's a good question so uh if i'm good at one thing it is convincing people to give me money to do the things that i want to do anyway um as you can probably see from so the work history. Story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um and so when I was in school, I went to Pitzer College. It's a private school. It's part of the the Claremont Colleges Consortium in SoCal, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's hallmark is really just that they're pretty uh, they're they're pretty they encourage latitude in their st students, and they really just kind of it's it's a place to go and do uh, more of the things that you want to do. Um, at least that's what it was was for me. So while I was there, uh, I majored in philosophy. Um, I was a debater when I was in high school, and so philosophy was both, oh, this is something I'm interested in and something I already have experience with, but it was also eight courses and no thesis to graduate. So I was like, tight. I'm going to graduate out here on time. This isn't going to be too hard, and I can do a whole bunch of other stuff. And so I spent a lot of my free time. Uh, I, like, I, was a, I was probably a B-plus student for most of, of my degree classes, but I also spent a lot of time there studying Japanese. I got to study abroad in Japan mm -hmm. for, for a semester. Um, I did a lot of uh, community organizing with the Asian American student body um, mm -hmm. in the colleges, which was hugely uh, just beneficial for just learning how, how to work with people, really. And, and then I spent a lot of time doing martial arts, right? Um, so philosophy degree isn't really good for anything specific. The uh, kind of the one concrete benefit it gives you in the job market is that you uh, are pretty well positioned to take the LSAT. So if I wanted to be a lawyer, um, I could like I, I could have done that. And actually, I took a practice LSAT because my girlfriend at the time made me, and then I, I did a little better than she did, even though I didn't do any of the prep or anything. She got really mad at me for that. <laughs> uh, but I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer. Um, and I had been freelance writing for some time, so I know all about that hustle, Amanda. That was very different fucking when I was freelancing in, in high school and college and shit. Um, but so after, after I finished up my boxing coach work, I started working in tech journalism for a while. I was reviewing TVs and doing Windows how-tos at PC World for several years. I said several for a millennial at several. I, I did it for like three, three and a half years, something like that, which like, I feel like if for your first job straight out of college, like that's a long time to stick around. At least it was for us. Um, I was there for a couple of years and then I got tapped to be the editor in chief of game developer magazine, which was an industry publication run by the same company that does Gama Sutra and GDC. That was a lot of fun. Um, my friend, Brandon, my friend and mentor, Brandon uh, Sheffield, was the editor-in-chief at the time, but he was on his way out so he could focus on his own independent development studio work. And so he wanted someone to kind of uh, fill his shoes, which I did for about a year and a half. And then the magazine died uh, because that's what magazines do. Yep. Uh, basically, the parent company cut all print. And so uh, there was a job for me. I could have continued working at GDC, and I did for like a month or two. But... Uh, Riot Games got in touch because they needed someone to edit the League of Legends kind of news stream, right? So uh, that seemed actually originally it was like, you know what? I'm sure I can help you find someone, but I was planning on move to Portland. It's like this long story. <laughs> but I kept talking to them and eventually uh, found something real cool um, and got the chance to work on League for two years as the editor in chief, which is weird. I don't know how many video games have had an editor in chief, um, but I was the editor in chief of League of Legends. Um, and then uh, I think it was Evo, I want to say it was, it was, it would have been 2014 and 2015. I had seen what the Cannon brothers were working on at, at that point. Cause they were getting some outside eyeballs on it. Right. So just to see like, Hey, do you think this is a thing? Um, and at Evo 2015 was when they did the rising thunder, uh, public alpha announcement. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I talked to Tom Cannon. I was like, hey, so at some point, you're going to need someone who does what I do for League of Legends. You're going to need someone who does that for your game. And he was like, well, we probably won't need that for a long time, but we do need a community manager right now because the forums are full with people and all we, we don't have anyone doing community management. Um, so within a month, I was the community, management, or community manager for Rising Thunder. Um, that lasted for six months, and then Riot acquired us, and... Uh, when Riot acquired us, uh, we decided to to stop supporting Rising Thunder. Uh, we brought it back later uh, in the Community Edition version. But um, when that happened, there's like, well, 
there's no community to manage anymore because we don't have a live game. So you should find something else to do. And I was like, well, I guess I'm a game designer now. And I've been doing <laughs> that for a couple of years. So yeah, it, it worked out. It is, I actually gave a talk on this at GDC um, a couple of years ago. It's called Weird Game Dev Jobs and How to Get Them. So if you want to find that on YouTube, you can. Um, but uh, yeah, my path into, into the industry was weird. It's pretty common these days for a lot of people to have weird paths. That's like the one thing about game dev that brings us all together um, is just that like people can get good at a whole bunch of weird stuff. And then sometimes that stuff ends up being useful for a game developer. And like maybe you didn't have the technical skills or the implementation, but you'll figure that out because what you this experience that you do have is invaluable and they need that on the team. Okay. Now let's 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 get to fighting games because you know it's a fighting game podcast. We've, we've yeah. talked about a lot of things that aren't fighting games. So <laughs> CVS two is the game that you got super serious about, but I think mm -hmm. a lot of sort of your modern era, right? Like if we were to try to like like you know do it like comic books like Bronze Age, Silver Age, whatever. Yeah. You know, in in the modern era for for Pat the Flip, uh, a lot of people know you for Guilty Gear, which is not a versus mm -hmm. game. Uh so how did you go from versus game to anime fighter? Sure. So CVS2, I'll start with CVS2, because I've actually been playing Guilty Gear since XX, okay. like around 2003. Um, the thing about CVS2 that we figured out within the first year or two of competition in NorCal um, is that at the high end of competition, you have to be able to do a lot of really tricky shit consistently to win, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're playing a groove, you have to be super on point with your custom combos and super on point with your roll cancels. If you're playing C groove, then you need to be on point with your roll cancels and your hit confirms into super, often uh, converting into supers off of one poke, right? Like Chun-Li's stand medium punch. Mm -hmm. And if you're playing K-Groove, then you need to have really good footsies, really consistent combo into super and really good JDs, right? And I was not particularly good at any of this stuff. Like I had, I had okay footsies, but I was not the most technical player. My execution fucking sucked. Um, and I did not really have the kind of work habits around training mode that uh, would kind of see me spending hours a day and you know practicing getting better. It just felt like, ah, oh, my hands can't do these things. For whatever reason, I can't do the things that other people can do. So I'm gonna try and find another way to win. But in CVS2, the longer you try to do that, kind of the harder it became. Um, and, around, and so what I noticed, the other thing is that CBS2 can be very boring when both players are good. Uh, there's a lot of turtling, a lot of whiffing normals to build meter or otherwise just not engaging because it, neither party would benefit from initiating an exchange. And so around that time, I got pretty tired of the game. I was like, man, I don't know about this. Like I played a little Third Strike, didn't like it. Played some Marvel 2 and it's cool, but it wasn't for me. And uh, a friend of mine from the Barricade was like, hey, you should check out this new game they've got at Sunnyvale. It's called Guilty Gear. I was like, sure, whatever. Just I'll, I'll play whatever you put in front of me. Um, so he showed me some foul stuff, and I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. Um, I wasn't trying to go down to Sunnyvale to play it a lot, but when we got at the Barricade, that's when I, I kind of started poking at it again. Um, and in particular, is like I played a little bit of Soul because everyone was playing Soul and doing Dust Loops, whatever, but I, I found Chip... Um, actually playing Guilty Gear X on Dreamcast, because I didn't have XX for PS2 yet. I didn't actually have a PS2 yet. Um, and so I got... Uh, so I started picking Chip, and then I started to win a couple games. I started to learn the combos, and just everything about the character felt really, really good. Um, and so I played Chip for a while, and I, I played a little, a little Eddie, a little Axel, a little Soul and Kai. Like, I played around a whole bunch. Um, and I... I'd play with whoever I could find locally. So like uh, Tragic used to host gatherings at his place in Japantown and him and Moko lived there. So I'd go out there with whoever wanted to play and we'd just play games all night, basically. Um, and so Guilty Gear was actually the game that I was getting into um, a little bit harder in kind of the, the early to mid aughts. So, but, but it was hard for me to keep up on it because Guilty Gear, it, it, there's just so much game in there that it'll, it'll devour your soul if you let it. <laughs> and I also, this was like pre-net play for most of us, so I didn't, it's not like I had anyone to play with. Um, so I kind of kept it in the back of my mind for a while, and then I really got into it harder, though. Like, I, I played Exert when it came out. I was like, yo, this game is super sick. Um, I played a little bit of Accent Core and Slash before that because I, I, when I was in Japan, I'd stop by arcades and see people playing. But I didn't, I didn't actually get super, super hard into uh, Exert until Rev 2. And what happened was I was, I was mostly playing Street Fighter V um, for the first two years or so that it came out. But 
Chip in Exert is pretty similar. Uh, at least a lot of his basics are the same as XX. So I, I, I picked up the game and started playing it, and then I got murdered by Nerd Josh's Elfelt and Alex Sanchez's Elfelt and uh, a whole bunch of other dudes from, from SoCal running Elfelts up in there. Sign Elfelt with some fucking bullshit. So I was like, oh yeah, this is what I hate about Guilty Gear. This is, what, this is why I stopped playing. But I'd still enter, and I, I'd enter and I'd, I'd hit buttons with Chip. I had a fun time. Um, but and I continued to try and play Street Fighter Five, but about halfway through season two, uh, my wife, I, I think it was after she moved in with me, um, and she was just like, you know, you're a lot happier when you play Guilty Gear compared to Street Fighter. And I was like, really? And then and I, I thought about it. I was like, yeah, that's actually true. And I thought about it, and, and I kind of figured out why. Um, like Street Fighter Five just wasn't really supportive of how I like to play, right? Which is honest shoutouts for you. Um, even in when Ryu was good in season one, like he was good for kind of dumb reasons. And uh, the the input lag on footsies just meant that a lot of the stuff that I like to do in Street Fighter 4 or in ST or in CBS2 didn't work. Um, or at least I couldn't get it to work. And Xrd, meanwhile, it kept on rewarding my time. Every time that I'd spend a little bit of, of time in training mode working on this or some or, you know grinding some sessions with someone, I'd come away from it and think, hey, I can point to some things in which I, I'm doing better and I know more about than I was before. Um, and it was really easy to feel myself growing and improving in Xrd. And uh, the, the really cool shit though was to see that this was actually reflected in my character. So the, 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 the better I got with the game, the smarter, the, I was making smarter decisions, but I was also able to see Chip just move faster and more intelligently um, than I had him move before. And so it, this, the game is just really good at giving you feedback saying, hey, uh, this game is hard and you're not doing one tenth of the things that you can do in this game, but you're doing more than you did yesterday and that's what's up. Um, and that, that was kind of how I came to ride super hard for Xrd, especially over the last maybe year or two, um, was just realizing like, this is a game that I don't, I don't, like the, the classic, the classic, you know, line back in the day in the arcades was like, you'd be playing a game and win or lose, you'd be like, man, fuck this game, right? Like, and we all have this kind of love-hate relationships with the games we play, because there's, at a certain point, the game's going to break your heart, but Guilty Gear has not broken my heart. Like Guilty Gear will, will it, it'll it'll punch me every now and then, but like you know I just gotta punch it back. <laughs> and like I really felt that 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 the the way it feels to get better at Guilty Gear is like how a fighting game should feel when you play it. Um, so that's kind of why I've stuck with it super hard, and why I try to get other people into it. Right? Like it's not easy to get into as your first fighting game, which is why I'm actually super stoked for Unist players because like at some <laughs> point. You just, like, I love Unist, I'm playing that game. I got, I got like, a nice chaos and shit. But, like, at some point, Unist players are going to be like, huh, you know, if, if that was the game that got them into anime fighting games, they're going to be like, okay, so let me learn more about the skills of your shit. And, oh, boy, their minds are going to be fucking blown. <laughs> so, you know what? Let's actually talk a little bit about Unist because, you know, they're one of – it's now one of the primary games at EVO this year, which, you know, mm -hmm. is a really cool experience because, you know, the people who play that game uh, – I've, I've only been going to EVO for three years now – and even I have, like, mad respect for the Unis community because, like, they, they come in, yeah. they do their shit, they come in in numbers, they they look like they're already a primary, like, a major title at EVO. And so for the community to, like, get rewarded, right? Because, you know, a lot of times we just feel like we're phoning it in. We're like, all right, we got to have our Street Fighter. You, you got to have the two Smash Bros. You, you got to have the NRS game, the Tekken game. And then, like... We'll, we'll throw something else in there, you know, a Pokin, a Blaz Blue, a Dragon Ball Fighters, and so, all right, the you know the the evil recipe has been completed, and mm -hmm. that's not what we're doing with Eunice, right? Like, this is just a evil recognizing a community and saying, you know what, you guys now deserve to be fully recognized as part of the evil experience. So, like, let's talk about that game a bit, and you wrote an article yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. I, I first encountered Unist actually when playing with kind of the, some of the SoCal uh, anime fam. Shout out to the folks from the house. And it's it's special. It definitely didn't stick with me the first. I've tried to get into this game like four times. <laughs> um, and it was only this recent moment that's really stuck. And a lot of that is the kind of network effect of having a lot of people get into the game with you, right? Um, from the, the the game is it, it's real interesting like the 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 closest i guess the, the the thing that i think defines it like characters are all really cool and it's got the full screen buttons the grid system is really cool and does a lot to kind of tell you like hey this is how you should be playing the game 
um, in a in a in a in a really like subtle way that I like. Um, but fundamentally, I think the thing the thing that I like about Unist is that there's kind of no space to breathe, right? Like you're on a relatively narrow playing field. The characters are capable of doing a lot of very big, significant stuff. And it's not like in Guilty Gear, if you're trying to dip out, you can instant air back dash, right? In Marvel, you super jump away and you block. And that, that's how you, you kind of buy your time, right? If you need to collect yourself, right? Um, Unist, like there's a lot of blocking in that game. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff that you can do to kind of slow things down a little bit. But fundamentally, everything the, your opponent is doing is something you always need to be paying attention to. Right, you can't you can't take your eyes off of them. You can't stop thinking about what they're doing for even just like a fraction of a second. Right, um, whereas like in Guilty Gear, when you get really good at your character, sometimes you're going to be autopiloting stuff. Right, you'll be doing the combo, and the combo is what lets you think about what you're going to do next. There's some of that in Eunice, but in general, it just it's very good at making it clear that your decision and their decision are always going to interact. Um, and and it, it, it means, I, I think this is actually why some people compare it to Third Strike, even though like the core combat is very not Third Strike-y. Mm -hmm. um, there's a similar feeling of like, there's I, I, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are on screen, there's something you could be doing to change the, the, the I guess, the, the advantage or the pace of gameplay very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's really cool. Um, I like Unist a lot. It is not nearly as free uh, free form as a Guilty Gear, nor is is it quite as complex as like a Blaze Blue, right? Um, and it's certainly not as like there, you don't have the team thing going on, so it, it's like significantly less complex than like a Marvel or, or Dragon Ball or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I really like. Uh, I really like the conversation that it can create between two players, right? So every every fighting game you can think of as a different messaging client, right? Mm -hmm. And like, if I play you in something, I'm going to get different vibes from you in one game than if I'm playing in another game, right? I really like what Eunice does to create um, a conversation that feels very like anime fighting game between folks without forcing you to learn the number of anime fighting game shit that you need to learn to play Guilty Gear. Um, and that's, that's, I think it's fucking dope. And also just like the characters, the aesthetic, the music, like it, it's been a while since I've seen a package this well-crafted and like French bread doesn't have fucking money. Like they don't, they don't have arc system works money to spend on development, right? The, the way that arcs just got to spend money on excerpt and whatever. Um, but they have, a, they make a lot of really smart decisions in how they produce the game. Little things around animation, little things around like move design and whatever. Um, even just like, they have like a kind of cinematic supers, even though they don't do 3d or break camera angles or anything, just by being super smart about like fading out the background and showing sprites that are from different locations or angles and shit. They, they, they make all these really smart, small changes changes um, and decisions that just show that they've got a whole lot of love and respect for the genre. Uh, and like, as a designer myself, like I appreciate that. There was, I, my favorite example of this is actually, uh, so you remember when people started adding a uh, button remap to the character select screen? Yeah. And that was, that was like a big thing, like, oh shit, Ultra Street Fighter 4 is button remap, right? How come your game doesn't have button remap? This is in Mike Z's talk about all the stupid shit he hates in fighting games, blah, 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 right? And Skullgirls, of course, is the best button remap screen, you know, whatever, because it's really important for competitors to be able to change their buttons before going into a match so you don't have to do the stupid button check thing if you don't want to, right? Mm -hmm. You just said, hey, we're going to let you pause during round start so you can handle it there, right? And that is like... It's a, it's a small decision to make. They didn't have to make a new menu. They didn't have to figure out a new UX for the, 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 the menu. They didn't have to figure out how it changes the flow. They're just like, fuck it. We'll let you pause here. You can do your thing, and then you can go right back into the match. It probably took them, I don't know, like 30 minutes to implement or whatever. Like, it's just so smart, and it didn't, it, it can't have cost that much. And then, like, I see decisions like that all over the game. Um, so, yeah, Eunice is dope. And, and the people who play it are also just like super sweet and like willing to te teach stuff. The NorCal local Unis community has been on point with just being super encouraging. And uh, a bunch of the Brett and a bunch of the, the like local top players ran uh, like a beginner's workshop at a game center a couple weeks ago. Like who who does that, right? Like the community is just so jazzed to see their shit being uh, kind of celebrated on the main stage, and they're just taking that energy and reflecting it out. It's beautiful. Yeah, no, I think the only community I ever saw do something similar was, like, early Pokin. When, like, mm -hmm. Pokin was trying to get people into. I saw a lot of the, you know, at the time, big Pokin uh, names really being like, hey, if you want to learn this game, like, reach out to me. And you don't really see that in a lot of other fighting games, 
right? You don't see Punk sending out a tweet like, hey, if you really want to learn Karen, you know, hit me up in DMs or find me on Discord and I'll teach you Karen. But when I was trying to figure out Pokken, I saw people like Catfight and Alistair like really being like, hey, if you want to learn Gengar, like here's this Gengar and like he will definitely like get online with you and like break the character down. So that's the only other community when you say like who else does it? Like Pokken was also really at the beginning like super into teaching everybody like how how dope their game was. Yeah. And like to a certain extent I feel like the if you if you love a game, it it, it can be pretty easy to want to put that passion out. Like I see I see a lot of people across fighting games doing great work to yeah. kind of welcome people into the games, but like they do it in different ways, right? Like for Guilty Gear, I run my stream and I, I'll teach people like one-on-one. -on -one. I encourage people to come to lobbies and play me. But a lot of what I'm doing is whooping your ass and then being like, <laughs> okay, so here's all the things that you can work on. Here's some tips on how to work on them. Like I'll see you next week or whatever, right? That is that is very different from Eunice players being like, you know, so here's the PowerPoint and here's the docs and here's the translated docs, you know, like here's everything about how you do this, that, and this other thing. Like they're just... I mean, they're they're super on point with their with their they're just being welcoming, right? That's the welcome mat for your fighting game. These folks are the people who are, who are saying, "Hey, get into this," right? Yeah. All right. So you know, man, you make my job so easy because you just you just I end know. on like really good talking points, and it's because you're also an interviewer. So like, you, you you're like you're, you're thinking for me, which is yeah. you know, your stream is like a very educational format. Like, yeah, you know. And, you know, we have some fun, like, when we were watching Daigo's video about younger mm -hmm. players, you know, we, we definitely know how to have fun and, like, have an active conversation that's, you know, not necessarily strictly just on guilty and getting better. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed both in your writing and the sort of vlog format that you do and even talking right now is that you seem to, and maybe it comes from the philosophy background, you seem to have uh, very well thought out ideas and how to translate them into a way that people can sort of receive and digest and understand i think that that's where a lot of your popularity comes from is that like usually when somebody's like i'm gonna teach you a thing you have to first like understand what they're saying before they can teach you a thing whereas mm -hmm. like there are concepts that you were talking about like i didn't do brazilian jiu-jitsu so like when you did um the importance the what was it last week's article well, it would be a couple of weeks ago and in, in the time frame where this episode <laughs> ends. Uh, but the one about losing, the right? about playing with your players, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, even without having the sort of frame of reference that, that you have, it was a very digestible article. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so I guess the question in this, long, in this long thing is, what made you want to get into teaching in this specific way, right? Because your teaching isn't, all right, send me some coaching money and like, we'll, I'll whoop your ass a bit and then I'll tell you what you could do better. And like, as you said, see you next week. Like, it, it really feels more like a holistic course. Like you could put out another book, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, first, thanks for the advanced plug on whatever my next book is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, I guess I have never been, I, 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 I guess to start with, I've never felt like I was a natural at anything except video games, right? Like I was just better than all the other kids in my class at video games growing up. And it wasn't really until high school that I found people just like in school who would be better at games than I was. And I was like, hey, wait a minute, I'm the guy who's good at video games, so like I need to get better at this shit, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I've never felt like I picked up a skill um, naturally. And I'm a very uh, verbal person, as you can tell by the volume of words that I've been saying. Um, I, I write and sometimes it goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, I learn with, through words that create concepts, right? So like you could give me a set of moves and I could practice them in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but I would have no clue how to apply them until I knew, um, until I could put a sentence in my head that describes like, oh, this move that you have, you want to do it when you see these things happening, right? And in both fighting games and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, like these are both you rely on your brain to tell your body what to do, right? And you can feel yourself be better and be faster and more technical and more accurate when you when your brain knows what it's supposed to do better, right? So I was I was I would find that just like a teacher explaining something the right way um, would be the difference between me getting a move and not getting a move, right? Or getting a concept and not getting a concept. Um, 
And, you know, this is stuff that you get practice with in philosophy and debate as well, right? Like um, when you're doing competitive debate, you have to argue with someone in front of a judge and you need to convince that judge that you are the, uh, the correct person in this argument. And sometimes that judge is just like somebody's mom who came in because they wanted to help out, right? So you can't rely on like an advanced grasp of debate theory or whatever. You have to be able to describe things simply, right? Um, so this has been a skill that I've kind of been cultivating over time and I actually, like, if you, you know, to, to go back to the, the career conversation from earlier, like, I never wanted to be in, in journalism or actually in games. My initial career plan was to work as a boxing coach until I could open my own school. Um, because I just, I really liked what the teachers have done for me um, in, in, when it came to kind of learning these super complicated arts, right? And I felt like someone should be able to bring that energy and, and apply it to fighting games. And so I started doing the stream uh, almost a year ago. I actually, I got my nose broken in kickboxing practice. So I was out of the gym for a month and I was like, well, fuck it. I guess I'll finally do get like super consistent with this stream. Um, and what I found is just that people were super down to talk about how to get better. And if I could get them to play with me and a lot of people were like super embarrassed or like, oh, I'm wasting your time, blah, 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 blah. Now fuck that. Um, uh, I could get them to talk with me and play and then I could tell them some stuff and then the not only would they get a little bit better, it would give them it would give them a reason to practice, right, and a reason to keep playing because now they have this thing to work on that they didn't work on before. Um, and yeah, I realized it's like this is actually a way sweeter deal than trying to teach martial arts for a living because that's kind of a whack job. And you know, if you if you get hurt or whatever, you might not have a career. Like I can just teach a whole bunch of people through the comfort of my living room or not living room, it's our study, mm -hmm. um, and. And if people are down to learn, then they're down to learn, right? And I've been super blessed to just cultivate an amazing group of people who want to keep on playing. And like a lot of them are not very good because the Guilty Gear might be their first fighting game. Um, or even if it's not their first fighting game, Guilty Gear is a fucking hard game to learn. Um, but we're all kind of getting better together and it's a super awesome vibe. Like it reminds me of having a local that I can just go to whenever I want. Um, and like when you have that kind of energy, like when those are the people that connect you to fighting games every day, it makes it so much easier to feel good about writing and putting yourself out there and doing more work to, to bring more people in, right? Like, you know, fighting games are great because of the people who play them. They're the, and the people you get to hang out and meet through playing them. If you didn't have great people, fighting games would fucking suck. And so, uh, if I can be a person that helps people get into fighting games, if I can be someone that uh, other people can use to kind of anchor their experience and say, hey, like, hey, playing Guilty Gear means that I get to hang out with all this cool group of people for, you know, an hour or two every day. Like, that's fucking sick. When I look at what fighting games did for me, it wasn't just, oh, this is this thing I'm obsessed with. It got me to hang out with a bunch of people who uh, were not from my high school. Like, I didn't get along with a lot of people at my high school. I just kind of didn't really fit in. Um, it got me to hang out with, like, that, fuck, that was like how I made Asian friends, basically, right? Like I grew up, uh, ha I'm half Filipino and half white, but I grew up with mostly white friends because I went to a lot of private schools and it was arcades that got me to hang out with like, and make like friends that I felt more comfortable with. So like fighting games have given me so much in terms of just great people. And I feel like that's the value that they have for anybody. Like even if like you can play fighting games and never get better at them, never get smarter, never get like more dexterous, whatever, right? Like you could do all that, but if you stay engaged and you meet some great people, like that's fucking worth it. I mean, that's why people keep going out to events, right? Like some people the the unfortunate thing about about a tournament is somebody has to go O2, right? <laughs> right? There's that's just somebody 25% of everyone who enters the tournament is going O2, yeah. right? Like so, yeah, it's people people need to feel okay about that, right? I mean, like, so, like, that's 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 the thing. Like, you know, I, I've talked to, like, James Chan about it. I've talked to a bunch of people about, like, you know, because, like, people say, like, oh, why would you go to Evo, right? Like, all the mm -hmm. best people are going to be there. Why would you that's go? That's why you go. Yeah. But, but, like, that's the concept that, like, a lot of people don't get. Yeah. And so that's kind of, like, why I like the the C in the FGC, the community. Because, like, you know, it's not that we're all, we're, we're all best friends, right? You know, you know. You know, not all Marvel people get along with all Street Fighter people, get along with all Tekken people. But within your community, you seeing people at events, and I've been to, you know, small events, I've been to big events. You know, once people get there, it reminds me a lot about, like, when I, when I used to travel to play Magic. 
you might be super mm-hmm. salty about going to the magic tournament and like losing and like you spent money and now you like all that practice you did but then you have the rest of the weekend to just be around your tribe and yeah. like play like play matches you know and i play casual i play a lot of casual magic formats you know play commander with people and similarly you know like you you go oh two you get over the salt for a bit you watch your friend you you get hyped about how they're doing you see that there's casual setups you're like oh man you know what i got mixed up by fgc jesus and there's this fang player over there that seems to be mixing people up let me go see if i can get some sets in so the next time i see fgc jesus i'm not going to get as as messed Mm -hmm. up right and i think that that's a really amazing thing that fighting games has over say you know like a cs go or a league of legends when you go to like those type of events you're purely going as a spectator mm-hmm. right there's you, you're not going to get to sit down and play with bjergsen right after after worlds that's just not this is not what's happening and for a lot yeah. of people you're just never going to get the opportunity you're never going to be challenger so you're never going to be in a game with him and like get that sort of information but you can go to an evo and see Problem X. And if he's not busy, he might play some sets with you. You might yeah. actually get to play with Problem X and ask him about the Bison matchup. Or even just walk up to him and be like, hey, I'm a Vega player and I just like don't understand this matchup. So like from your perspective, like what should I be doing? Like what makes you frustrated? Right? And you can't do that with a lot of esports or a lot of other just competitive games. Yeah. The the and and Tom Cannon has given a great GDC talk about kind of the roots of Evo and the arcade cult, how the old arcade culture informed a lot of its growth mm-hmm. over time. Um, so if any of y'all watching this uh, haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. If you just want to learn more about I'll, fi- I'll find all the links and maybe have you help me and we'll put them in the descriptions and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's. When I, when I describe what the fighting game community means to me, to people who don't get it, um, it, is, it is very much a feeling of like, when I go to a tournament, everyone there feels like I'm family, right? Um, and like the closest available uh, analogy I could offer is actually like the Juggalos. Like whatever this weird thing is that everybody here loves, well, we all love it. And that's enough for us to be connected with each other, right? Like, I think there's a lot of unique things about being part of the fighting game community. I think it's amazing that all of us are fundamentally there. And like, we all have this thing that we're working on in ourselves, right? Like everyone in fighting games, everyone who plays fighting games is constantly working on something. They're trying to better themselves in some way. And that's that's one thing that everyone, that's like the shared understanding that's super beautiful, right? But we're also just a bunch of weirdos who love this shit. <laughs> and it's super cool to be around other weirdos and love this shit and not feel like you have to hold back. Like, Evo is beautiful and every event is beautiful, but Evo is beautiful because, if, like, for that weekend, that casino, like, the, the, the hosting venue, like, fighting games are the thing that matters. And if you don't care about fighting games and you're there, well, you're in the minority, right? Like, and you just get to walk around with the sticks and not be questioned. You get to fucking, you get to just yell random shit in elevators about fighting games and people are gonna laugh, right? Like, it's, it feels great. Um, and it is, I think, because like, it, part of it is the open entry of the tournaments. Part of it is just getting a bunch of weirdos in. Um, but part of it is that like, I don't know, that, Every, like we're older we're the we're the oldest probably the oldest uh continuous fu- like video game community right so the the thing that we built isn't just it's not just here because uh, a publisher says hey we're gonna spend a lot of millions of dollars to make this event happen or whatever this thing we built is here because we needed it to be part of our life right and like the kids coming in these days they're they're coming into a, a, a game and a genre that we've been playing for decades, right? It's on us to be to be good to them about it, right? It's not like oh, we're both we're all just starting to play this new game, and so we're all like pieces of shit to each other because this game has ex- existed for six months. Like, no, we we live here, right? This is our home, and and so we need to make sure that the the people who come and want to be part of our home are coming in and they're, they're like and they're down for this shit, right? And they're here to offer their own kind of unique funk and shit, you know. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we've been at this for... <laughs> no, it's, it, it's, it's really yeah, awkward. Uh, great. Anyway, because... bye. Well, no, no. It's just that, like, you know, I mean, this is something that I could talk about forever. I know. I know. And I think, I think that this is that type of topic that you could, you could get almost anyone to talk about, right? Like, I could have gotten mm-hmm. JB to talk about this. Or, I, you know, future guests, we could probably go on this, like, really long talk about why fighting games are great, you know? 
Yeah. Uh, a lot of people who only watch Evo through, you know, the ESPN coverage, right? Everybody knows the Takedo moment of saying fighting games are great, right? So, so good and so perfect, right? And, you know, the, then you get the James Chen crying and then, you know, he tells yeah. you about the fighting games is love and you know evo you hold the l and when you run it back you get evo <laughs> you know you get right like it's a very great emotional like thing yeah. right um but i also don't want people to have to listen to like a three-hour podcast so <laughs> this more is... of this come to twitch.tv slash path to flip where i will say good shit about fighting games and critical shit too don't get me wrong but i will i, I got yo i got the sappy shit on deck Oh Maybe. man, we were we were sappy as fuck during the okay. tequila, during the Daigo video. <laughs> Alright, so they, they now know about the Twitch. I hear that you have this thing called a Patreon. What's the Patreon link? Yo, so I'm it's at patreon.com slash path the flip. If you don't know what Patreon is, it is a service that you can use to uh, uh, offer uh, like basically a subscription service to people who make things that you like. Um, so Amanda's got one too. You should definitely check that one out. Uh, for me, the Patreon is a way for people to tell me that they really like my stuff and they want me to keep doing it. Um, it's it, so it, this this goes to support some of my writing work, um, all the writing that I do about fighting games and leveling up and all that stuff. It also uh, it, it helps support the stream. Um, it is not a like, hey y'all, I really need this money to do blah thing because like I got a full time job, I'm taking care of y'all. Don't need to worry about me for that. But as a writer on the internet, I am super used to not getting paid for my work, right? Oh, um, which really? I think you can relate to. <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, let me tell you. Yeah. Writers on the internet are typically like, we're witty. We get lots of retweets. Sometimes we write things that people really like or they really hate and they do not feel shy about telling us that. But very rarely do people get paid directly for write, for for the writing work on the internet. And if they are, it's probably not the work they want to be doing. And I say this as someone who's been working, who worked in web content for several years, right? Um, like, the market forces shape the writing that you do into something that you might not like a whole lot. And so for me, like getting the Patreon going and just seeing how many people were down for like the super dank Patrick Miller, right? Like this isn't Patrick Miller because Giant Bomb got him or Patrick Miller because, you know, he showed up on Wired or, or you know, Polygon or whatever the fuck. This is like... Even even my SRK stuff, right? And like mm -hmm. SRK was super loose with with what uh, the kind of stuff they could do there. But like I'm writing this this I'm writing stuff the way that I want to read it. And so when people people drop me a couple bucks on the Patreon, it's real nice because it's telling it's it's them telling me like, hey, I like the shit you're doing, right? Not the shit you did for someone else, but the shit you do for you. Um, and so yeah, it's it's I've been surprised at, at kind of how motivating it is for me to just see people you know send send love. Yeah. Uh, and I feel the same way because I'm I'm also partially doing this show and being able to go to events because of my Patreon. So I definitely understand yeah. that feeling. Uh, so to both yes, of our patrons, all the Patreon dollars. Yep. So to both of our patrons, we definitely want to say thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you know, tune in next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, Vexini. A uh, really good FGC photographer and just esports photographer in general mm -hmm. is going to be our guest. And we're going to talk about uh, sort of the differences between covering things like a CSGO event versus going to something like a CEO. We're going to go over some of her favorite uh, pictures of all time. And yeah, it should be pretty dope. But until next time, go beyond plus ultra and peace.